One of the most commonly used valuation methods is the comparables method. It's used definitely for the terminal value calculation that was described in prior video. But it's also used all the time in just even the current valuation of a business. The reason for this is the discounted cash flow is a forecast from inside the business of what they think they can do and what that value might be worth. The comparables method gives a balance to that that says businesses that are actually operating, what kind of valuation do they get? Because if you understand what Starbucks is getting and someone else is opening a coffee shop, then you understand, you can value, you can see the discounted cash flow valuation of the coffee shop, compare that to Starbucks and say, does this make sense or not? And then perhaps adjust your discounted cash flow assumptions because of what you know from what the marketplace is actually telling you. So comparables is used not just as an augmentation for terminal value, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also as a way to sense check your underlying discounted cash flow modeling. Now, comparables is good on for that, but if you think about it, what comparables don't tell you is what's going on inside the business. So you need the model itself, which shows you the discounted cash flow, and you need that to somehow map, because that tells you what's actually happening inside, the choices that are being made, the assumptions that are being taken, all of that is being explicitly described in a plan. And if that maps to what marketplace value drivers are for comparable companies, then you think that maybe this plan makes sense, right? So you actually use these two balancing one another to find where somewhere in the middle there's truth, if you will, of what this business is likely to do and what it might be worth. The discounted kind of cash flow, the business plan modeling gives you all the in internals. The marketplace valuation doesn't give you as much internal information, but it does tell you what people are actually willing to pay for companies like this when they buy stock on the stock exchanges. So there's a balancing act that occurs. Now, because of the uncertainty in the business planning that we were describing in some of the prior videos, when you get out to year five and you do this terminal value calculation, if you're a practical person, you say this theoretical, this financial theoretical modeling doesn't hold up because for five years I'm deciding I'm going to build this business from scratch to something real and then I'm saying and by the way that's going to grow forever at a certain rate and there's not a lot of sense around um, not a lot of uh, validity to that other than you starts to feel like you're making stuff up and people that are practically putting their money at risk want more than that now I'm, the, the, the that analysis is important because it underlies the theory of it, and you could, you could use it again to balance what you're coming up with, but at the same time, you want something more practical. The comparables method really is extremely helpful for putting some sense behind this. I'm starting a coffee shop, and I grow it for five years, and then I'm going to sell it. So you want to say to yourself, if I'm going to sell it, what will I be able to sell it for? And the good news is I now have a four-year-old company. If you look into the future, I now have a four-year-old company. That four-year-old company has some value that I can find out because there are comparable companies like Starbucks and others that are currently in the marketplace, and I know how they are valued. And so I'm saying my company will be valued in the same comparable way when it's sold. So what's the valuation of that company five years out and then of course you discount that back to the current time frame so you can use the terminal value and by saying I'm selling the company you sell it based upon comparable valuation and that's another way to get the terminal value when you think about it right so that's how we think about using one way to use this comparables method not discounting the others that I mentioned so how does it work we look at public companies <clears throat> like Starbucks and Panera Bread and um, any other companies that you can find that are similar to the company that you're involved with. You also, if you're a professional organization, you have access to information about initial public offerings, how much new startup companies were uh, initially offered for that are in the restaurant business. There are firms, there's a thing called Venture Finance that produces uh, documentation and valuation and dollar sounds that these large organizations pay for. Venture Economics and others 
It costs money, but it gives you all of the M&A transactions, all that is merger and acquisitions when these companies are sold. It gives you all the IPO transactions, what their valuations and factors and all of that are. And based upon that, you can tell five years out if you are successful in doing the plan, what you're likely to be able to achieve when you try to monetize that in the market. M&A transactions, public companies, and IPOs. We, as... Um, as being outside of that click of, of people that have that access and information, primarily rely on public companies. But if you're a professional, you are willing to pay significant dollars for these services that provide all of the information about these more private transactions, like M&A transactions and IPOs, although IPOs aren't private, but they have a lot more, they, they compile all of that information for us. Uh, for the for those firms, so you have all of that information, and from that you look at comparable companies and you find out what their cash flow is, what their EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. You look at their EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, which is operating profit, their earnings, net income, and their sales, and you look at all of these measures to the extent you can get them, and then you figure out what the stock market price or the acquisition price for the whole business was. If your EBITDA was a million and the company sold for six million, then you have a six times multiple of your EBITDA. That's the valuation. And you look at a bunch of companies that are similar to your company, and you may find that some of them have a six times multiple, some of them have a 6.5, some of them have a 5.8, well, that tells you that somewhere along the line you have an EBITDA multiple of six or so, which is a comparable value, which means if I can build a successful company over five years, and five years from now it's generate a million, generating a million dollars in, in uh, EBITDA, then a six times that the business ought to be worth, as a whole enterprise, six times one if the conditions five years from now are the same as now, and if indeed my operation is as profitable as my plan suggests, it will be worth six million. So your year five cash flow is six million. You've sold the company for six million under that scenario, and then you discount that back to try and incorporate the business plan risk of getting to that point and using that same number we talked about earlier. Each of these different financial metrics helps you understand the value of the business. Each of them going down this list is harder, or excuse me, is easier to come by. It's harder to come by the cash flow number because it's particularly free cash flow because you have a lot of noise in there with financing back and forth and whatever. EBITDA, not every company reports EBITDA. EBIT operating profit, not every company reports EBIT if it's a private company. Um, so it gets harder to get these numbers as you go. You always get earnings if it's a public company or anything like that, and you always get sales. So you start with a sales multiplier, and then you have a earnings multiplier and an EBIT multiplier. The best is cash flow, but different kinds of industries tend to be valued around different numbers, uh, particularly if there's a lot of noise and there's not, and some startups like technology startups don't often don't make positive profits for a number of years, so they typically are valued as a sales multiplier. Um, if you're making a million in sales, if you're making a million in sales, you might have a three times multiplier, a five times multiplier, a ten times multiplier. So your company, if it's a ten times multiplier and you have a million in sales and you're growing really fast, but you're not profitable, it still may be worth $10 million if comparable companies get 10 times their sales, their current year sales, as a valuation. So you use all of this data and you try to find how the market is valuing assets like the company that you're using. If earnings are all over the map for these companies, then it's really hard to get a consistent number and you have to start moving up the scale. In this case, it would be to sales and say, are they, multi are, they, are they valuing them similarly on sales? And if they are, then you start to say, okay, this is a five times sales marketplace. So in your valuation discussion, you use five times sales as your number. And you assume your year five terminal value is 
be your year five sales multiplied times a multiple, and you say, this is my terminal value. So going back to your cash flow discussion, your year one, your year zero cash flow is what you start, you put in to start with. Your year one cash flow is the amount of cash flow the first year. Year two, the second year. Year three, the third year. Year four, the fourth year. Year five, the cash flow is as if you sold the business, the investor gets the full value of his share or her share of that business when it's sold, say it's $5 million and they own 50%, their year five cash flow is $2.5 million. And then you discount all of those back to the present time, and that's how you get your valuation, the valuation of the business. This is the way to be thinking about how this whole valuation process works. In the final video, Next, I'm going to talk about some of the other things that can be done to help value businesses if these kinds don't seem to be centering around anything that you can be confident that you feel you have a sense of the true value, like whenever you're doing comparables or whatever. Some other methods you can, uh, you can use to help value a business that maybe is not doing all that well or maybe doesn't it make profits or maybe is uh, going sideways, that sort of thing, meaning it's not really growing, um, other methods of valuing, and uh, in the final video, that's where we'll go.